It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Maury Nussbaum, who's going to give our keynote. And as I said, I think this is really going to set the foundation for the day on some of the work he's done. Um, we'll get to hear from him again on the applied, but this is largely going to be, I think, his fundamental research on exos and what potential they have to help people. Okay. Welcome. Do me a favor and switch it out. Yeah. Okay, so thanks for the introduction. How's my volume? Everybody can hear me okay? All right, great. So I'm from Southwest Virginia, so I should probably say, good morning, y'all. How you doing? <laughs> um, I actually grew up in New York, so maybe I could say, how you doing? Um, but somewhere along the line, I either lost or didn't pick up. Um, I, I don't know what my accent is anymore, because I've lived in different parts of the country. So I'll just say good morning. It's my pleasure to be here and uh, share some information with you. Um, somewhat contrary to Jack's introduction, this will not be a talk on fundamental research. Uh, I didn't want to turn this into a lecture. And in fact, the title you see here is not the same title as what's in the program. I'm going to talk at, at a high level with examples. Um, I have a few points I want to make, and I want to make those more visually than technically. And Hopefully I have some success in doing that and leaving you with some thoughts. Uh, I'll try to be clear where I'm offering personal opinions versus uh, information supported by hard facts. So to be a little uh, more detailed, I will talk a little bit about what exoskeletons are. Um, <clears throat> I can't even see my own slides. Give me a second. <laughs> Highlight some of the existing evidence, and there is a lot out there. It's a, um, I'm trying to figure out how to enlarge this a little bit so I can actually see it without having to wear my glasses. I'm going to spend a little time talking about potential limitations. You'll see a lot out there about exoskeletons can do this, they can do that. I, I think it's important to think about, are there, is there any downside? Nothing's perfect. There's no silver bullets. And then, as best I can, where I think we're going to be in the future, at least on a, a few years' time horizon. So what is an exoskeleton? Well, here's a formal uh, definition out of ASTM, the standard organization. You'll hear more about that later today. Uh, essentially, it's a device that helps the person through some mechanical or physical interaction. <clears throat> Lots of different ones out there, so building on... Jack's introduction, and one of the points I want to make toward the end is this field is rapidly expanding. There's a lot of really clever people out there developing really clever technologies. So it's going to be exciting to watch over the next few years, and also building on Jack's introduction. This is not new. Okay? These devices have actually been built and in some cases tested. What I find a little bit interesting is it seems the people uh, going back to the late 1800s, kind of started from an incredibly complex perspective. They built devices to do almost everything for a person. But what we saw starting in the mid-2010s, around 2014, 2015, commercial devices that appeared on the market, which were actually quite a bit simpler and more focused on a particular body part. And then it, it kind of took off after that. So where are we at now? There's this wonderful website called exoskeletonreport.com where they keep track of what's out there, mainly the commercial market, but also a few prototypes that are be being developed around the world. And there's just about 50 devices designed for occupational applications. You can break those down. They're mainly to support the upper extremity, largely the shoulder, or the low back and hips. But there's devices emerging as well for the lower extremities, the legs, for the hands to do gripping tasks, and other devices to support a tool. So there's a lot out there. We can further break it down by how they work. They differ in terms of their energy sources. Most commercial devices, almost all of them, are passive. Okay? They have elastic elements like springs that react to a person's uh, motion and generate forces or torques in an appropriate way, and I'll say more about that in a second. Again, most of the devices out there are to support the arms, particularly the shoulder or the low back, and most of them are applicable for a few tasks. 
They don't solve all problems, but they're mainly designed and currently being used for things like lifting, holding, and overhead work. And to my knowledge, I can't, I've had trouble pinning down the exact number, but there appear to be tens of thousands of these commercial exoskeletons in use around the world. Where did I come up with that number? Well, in contacts with various salespeople. When I talk to them at conferences or on the phone, I ask naively and in my nicest voice, how many of you sold? And a number of the companies have said X thousand. Okay, so I add all those up, that's how I come to tens of thousands. So a little bit, how do they work? What's the idea for those that haven't seen them or used them? We can broadly look at some basic support mechanisms. So arm support exoskeletons, most of them are put on like, sort of like a backpack. They have different structures, attachments to the body. Ultimately, they generate a torque about the shoulder, or a moment, my M, through a force that's created on typically the upper arm. So that force creates a moment, and it's in the opposite direction to what gravity is doing to the arm or any loads in the hands. So if I'm holding a tool, Gravity wants to rotate my shoulder down. The exoskeleton is like a person that comes up behind me and holds my arm up. Kind of simple, right? Back support exoskeletons, conceptually similar. If I bend over and I'm lifting or holding an object, there's a moment or a torque moving me forward. I need to use my back muscle that creates loads on my spine. The exoskeleton offsets or counteracts that moment. There are also soft exoskeletons that are called exosuits that use essentially elastic bands and do something very similar. And that's one of the demos, I guess, that will be available later. And then there are a few tool supports. These have not received as much positive reception, but the idea is to support the tool instead of the person's body parts and to transfer the load to away from the upper extremity, say to the hips or even down to the ground. So in a little more detail, here's what a PhD student I'm working with, just to demo what's going on. He's wearing an arm support exoskeleton, and I've just tried to show through the yellow arrows what happens as he raises his arm. This particular device, the more you raise your arm, the more torque is generated about the shoulder. It peaks at about here, which is where gravity causes the largest effects on the shoulder, smaller effects down here, smaller effects up here. So these are designed in a logical way to su provide support, to offload the muscles in the shoulder in, in postures where you want more or less support. Very similar for a back support exoskeleton. Here, the torque or the offset at the low back increases the more you bend over. Both of these devices, as I've noted, are passive. So there's no intelligence in there, there's no computer chip. It's an elastic element and the designers are able to construct it so that torques are generated in specific patterns. So as a function of arm elevation or as a function of trunk flexion. What we're seeing emerging though is smart technology. Okay, there's a couple of active back support exoskeletons Active meaning there's an active torque generator. It's not a passive elastic element. It's a motor controlled by very sophisticated and increasingly sophisticated control algorithms, which are often based on sensors applied either to the person or to the exoskeleton. So it's monitoring what the person is doing to apply appropriate torques about different body parts. <clears throat> okay, so broadly, before I talk about what we know, what are the potential benefits and limitations? Well, I think there's a clear opportunity provided by this technology to decrease physical demands and maybe even increase or enhance worker performance. And we'll see briefly as I summarize the evidence, that opportunity seems to be present to some extent. Are there risks? Could we enhance or increase physical demands at other body parts? Does putting on an arm support exoskeleton, while it may help the shoulders, could it affect the back, the hips, the legs? And we're seeing some evidence that that could be true. We're not quite sure of the extent yet. Could there be safety implications? Well, I'm gonna show you an example toward the end that suggests there could be. Okay. Although this has been a pretty heavy and exciting research field since about 
uh, almost 10 years now, I'd say about 2014, um, there's still a lot we don't know. I, I still think the existing evidence is not sufficient to support justifiable practical guidelines. So if you're a practitioner, you would like to know, I can use exoskeleton X for worker Y doing task Z, and this is what I can expect. We're not there yet. I don't know that we'll be there for several years yet. So that is one of the current and I think continuing challenges. Okay. So let's talk about the positives. What are the potential benefits in a little more detail? So I'm using the shorthand ASE, arm support exoskeleton offload the shoulders, doing tasks where you're working with your arms elevated or even overhead. I think there's pretty clear evidence that exoskeletons have the potential to address the major risk factors that we've known about for quite a while. So non-neutral postures, exerting forces, repeated and sustained efforts. Okay. Just some highlights, very, definitely highlights. There's hundreds of papers out there. I didn't want to spend a half an hour boring you with a technical lecture. So I tried to boil it down into a, a few key points, which I think are justified based on the evidence. I'm also mentioning a few commercially available exoskeletons, not because I'm being paid to do so. So I'm not currently supported financially by any exoskeleton company. I was in the past, to be honest. I don't own stock in any of these companies on purpose. Okay. Um, so I'm just mentioning them as examples. Remember the slide previously, there's 48 companies selling exoskeletons. I'm just mentioning a few as examples, so please don't take this as support for these particular companies or their devices. Okay? So some early work showed that a the exobionics, again, is one example, uh, decreased shoulder muscle activity, decreased spine loads, and this was done in the context of simulated overhead work. Another device by Sudex, both companies out in California, by the way, also decreased shoulder muscle activity. Uh, there was some work showing that uh, there can be beneficial and suboptimal support levels. One thing it's worth noting is that almost all commercially available exoskeletons are adjustable. They're adjustable to different people. They're also adjustable in terms of the support they provide, which makes sense, and that's a good thing. If you're holding a very heavy tool, a grinder or a pneumatic drill, okay, you want a lot of support. If you, there's nothing in your hands and maybe you're doing wiring, a wiring task, okay, maybe less support would be optimal in that case. What one study showed is that you can set the support levels in an ineffective way. It can be too much or too little for a given task or set of task demands which is probably not surprising, but it showed quantitatively that it could have an important impact, and it emphasizes one more variable that has to be considered when using exoskeletons, that they need to be customized for a person in terms of size and shape, and customized for the specific task demands. What we have less of compared to lab-based uh, evidence is field-based evidence. It's growing, but it's growing much more slowly than lab-based results. And that's a problem, as I'll mention in just a few minutes. So there's been quite a few studies on the Levitate device, another one that will be demoed later, showing some beneficial effects. Decreased shoulder muscle activity, a recent paper showing a decreased fatigue in manufacturing tasks. Um, beneficial applications in surgeons, okay? some potential benefits in other sectors, wholesale and retail trade. Okay? So there's growing evidence from the field, but it's growing fairly slowly, but it's generally positive. Okay? One, well, maybe one exception to these fairly clear positive results is our results at Ford, which were more mixed, and you'll hear more about that later today. Now look at, let's look at the other major applications, so the low back. BSEs, or back support exoskeletons, again, have pretty, there's pretty clear results saying they have the potential to address what we know are the major risk factors for low back injuries. So excessive loads, repetitive loads, sustained loads. What do we know? Again, quite a body of literature from lab-based studies. Again, I'm just highlighting a few examples. The LEVO, which is a device out of the Netherlands, has been around. It was one of the first commercial devices available. 
showing some benefits, decreased muscle activity, okay? increased endurance to do a prolonged task, reduced energy expenditure for repetitive tasks, and across several studies showing that these benefits were found in a variety of different tasks. So relatively static tasks where you have to adopt a non-neutral posture and maintain it for a while, and also dynamic or repetitive tasks such as lifting. Another device that's also been tested fairly extensively is the BACX by SUDEX. Similar results, reduced muscle activity, reduced muscle fatigue, reduced energy expenditure, again in a variety of tasks. Less evidence from the field for, for back support exoskeletons. So some of the potential, uh, there were some potential benefits, but also some suggestions of adverse effects like increased heart rate. Okay. So here we're starting to see that there's some mixed evidence, some benefits, but maybe there's also some downsides. So that was my summary of the body of literature, very quick. What's the take-home point? Well, there seem to be some benefits, pretty clear benefits across lots of lab-based studies. Some hints, maybe, of some potential downsides. Okay. But I want to make a few key points. Most of our evidence is what researchers talk about as efficacy, not effectiveness. The terminology differs, but efficacy means does it have the potential to provide a benefit? That's what lab studies show us. And there's dozens and dozens of them that have shown clear efficacy of a variety of different exoskeletons for a variety of different tasks. Effectiveness means does it work in reality? We have some field studies showing, yeah, there's, in some cases it seems to be beneficial, but we're also learning there's some downsides. What's really missing is effectiveness from a very specific perspective, and that's does it contribute to MSD prevention? So it's the risk of musculoskeletal disorders decreased when using an exoskeleton. Okay. To my knowledge, the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> what kind of answer is that? Well, we don't have any evidence. I'm not aware of any studies that have had musculoskeletal disorders as an outcome measure. They may have been done, but I've not seen it in the literature. The Ford study we did, right, that's a pretty well-known study these days, at least among researchers. We did not have musculoskeletal disorders as an outcome measure. There's none occurred in the study. Right. So again, I, I kind of shrugged my shoulders. We don't know. So That's the ultimate question, and right now, I would say we have no idea. Okay. I also want to make a point at the bottom right, if you can read it. <clears throat> I came across a, a recent study, actually 2021, which, may, which the results of which suggest that lab-based results may not always transfer to the field. And the, as primarily a lab-based researcher, I got really depressed about that. Okay. We've published a dozen or so studies from lab-based testing. And I'm left wondering, what's, what's the utility of that work? Right? It showed efficacy, but it may have nothing to do with effectiveness if lab results and field results are fundamentally different. So let me talk about that study for a little bit. Okay. Again, 2021. They tested two passive shoulder exoskeletons, one by SUDEX and one by SKELEX, which is a company in the Netherlands. So arm support exoskeletons. Um, they addressed many research questions in their study. It's a very nice study. The one that caught my attention was looking at the relative effectiveness of these devices in lab-based testing and field-based testing. Okay, so they tested people under very controlled conditions. These were actual workers, and they did some fundamental tasks that looked like what their actual job demands are. So you can see from this picture, the arms extended, arm overhead, bending down, and so forth. And they tested both devices using a variety of very good outcome measures, subjective responses, measures of muscle activity. And then they had people do their jobs, which is in a warehousing or distribution environment. And they were very clever. They picked off aspects of the work that looked like those controlled conditions. 
So you can kind of make a direct comparison under very controlled conditions, which is what we typically do in the lab, versus field conditions. And if many of you have probably seen warehouse workers, they're, they're moving pretty quick. They're doing lots of different physically demanding work. But what did they find? They found that both arm support exoskeletons uh, decreased upper trapezius muscle activity, so the muscles up here, which are very active when your arms are elevated or overhead, and also uh, decreased heart rate. In the isolated tasks, so the controlled, almost lab-like testing, what they found in the field were effects that were almost half the size. Okay. So that's one concern, is that the magnitude of benefits we find in the lab might overestimate the benefits in the field. What was really concerning, and this is what got me particularly depressed, the relative effects of the two devices, remember they tested two different arm support exoskeletons, they differed. In the controlled settings, ASE1 was better than ASE2 for some tasks. When they went in the field, it was exactly the opposite. So if you were to use lab-based results to pick a better or your choice of arm support exoskeleton among the d dozen or so available, you might make the, r the wrong choice. So hopefully you can appreciate again why, as a lab-based researcher, this got me kind of depressed. Okay. What it suggests is we need to be careful. We as researchers, others as consumers of research, that lab-based testing uh, is relatively easy. Not easy, it's relatively easy. We have controlled conditions, we can get lots of technical measures, um, but ultimately we want to know what's going to work in the field. And that's harder to do, but definitely necessary. Okay, so some key points. Again, I want to leave people with what I think are some important aspects of the state of the art. So there are definitely benefits of arm support and back support exoskeletons, a huge database to support that. But that data also, also suggests that those benefits depend on the design. Okay. There, are, um, there are enough evidence out there to show that in, in some cases, device one can work better than device two. But even those differences can be task dependent. Device one is better than device two for task A, but not for task B. That's starting to sound really complex, and I think it is. I think that's one of the key points, is that it is very complex. We're also learning more about the potential for adverse effects. For now, I think they're mainly minor, maybe moderate. So I can't say wearing an exoskeleton is going to hurt somebody. I'm not going there. And in fact, I don't think that's typically true. But I also think it's the case that we can't assume there will only be benefits from exoskeletons for reasons I'll talk about in a minute. Again, I don't want to get into lots of technical details and journal publications, but there's also growing evidence that fitting is critical and also an ongoing problem. Um, somewhat of an overgeneralization, through our testing with lots of volunteers and lots of workers, Overall, women just are not comfortable wearing most commercial exoskeletons. It's probably not a surprise to you that women have different shapes than men, and it seems like the accounting for those differences in shape and anthropometry is not quite there yet. We've also come across many cases where uh, r fairly large and fairly small people just can't use the technology. Okay? So, I think the designs are getting better over time, but there's still work to do. Perhaps my, one of my key points is that evidence from, uh, of long-term effects is, is almost non-existent. We and many other research groups around the world have done mainly short-term testing, because it's easy. You bring people in the lab for an hour or two. You go out in the field and you measure people for an hour or two. But what does that tell us? Well, it tells us the acute effects. It doesn't, does that generalize to someone wearing an exoskeleton for a day, a week, a month, a year? Again, I gotta say, I don't know, because we don't know. Still a lot to learn. So let me expand a little bit on some of these points. One is the task-specific and device-specific nature of the effects of exoskeletons. 
So we recently completed a study. It was well overdue, it was funded by Ford, sorry Marty. Um, took us a lot longer to do because of course we started it during COVID and only finished it recently because of that. But we simulated a variety of overhead tasks and we purposely included a wide variety of tasks. So different heights, different for force directions. We were trying to capture some of the variability that's present in overhead work, particularly in automotive assembly, but not exclusive to that. And we also used three different exoskeletons that differed quite a bit in their design approach. Uh, because we were interested uh, in this specific issue. How do the benefits of an exoskeleton differ between different task demands and the designs of the device? Right. And we have tons of results. I've just picked off one graph to make the point. So we had people working at three different heights, and this is one particular muscle, the left sternocleidomastoid, so in the neck, which tends to get activated if you're looking up and or reaching overhead, which our people were doing. Okay. The white bar is the activation of that muscle as a percentage of maximum. So that muscle wasn't working hugely. It was maybe 5 to 15% of maximum. But the point I wanted to make in this graph is that the three exoskeletons we tested in red, green, and blue showed a kind of inconsistent pattern. The red one, whatever that was, um, seemed to be, well, maybe the worst at a low height. Um, not so good at a medium height, okay at a high height. Okay. Looking at the other two exoskeletons, it, it kind of varies. So whether the exoskeleton even worked in terms of offloading this muscle compared to not using an exoskeleton depended on the task height. So that's the, the task specific nat nature. And if you compare those colored bars across the three heights, you see there's an inconsistent pattern. In the first two clusters, it goes red, green, blue. If I move over to the right, it goes red, green, now blue. So that's what I mean by an example of device specific effects. So it depends on the combination of the technology and the task demands. And we have many other graphs showing something similar. An example of, again, task specific and device specific effects. This case for lifting. So we had people do repetitive lifting from two different symmetric heights in front of their body and then asymmetrically. And we use two different exoskeletons in this case. Um, it's not as dramatic here, but I'm showing results for the three different types of lifts, symmetric starting from ground level, symmetric starting from knee level, and then asymmetrically starting from knee level. Again, the white bar is no exoskeleton, and the two devices are the, the two different gray bars. The outcome measure in this case was energy expenditure. So kilocalories per minute, which was normalized to body weight. Um, what are the relative differences? <clears throat> Again, it depends on the device. We don't see a clear pattern in these bars across the three different conditions. So it depends on the task. It also depends on the exoskeleton. Again, this is sounding really complex. And the bad news, it just is. That's the nature. Right? There are, I would say, no simple answers. Now I'm gonna transition a little bit to talk a little bit more about potential adverse effects. Okay. I do wanna start by saying I am a champion of occupational exoskeletons. I love them. Right. I'm gonna say some things that may make it sound like, oh, Nussbaum got up and said you shouldn't use exoskeletons because of the potential adverse effects. No, that's not the message I wanna leave you with. I think it's amazing technology, and as we move forward, it's going to help a lot of people. The point I do want to make is that we need to be aware of potential problems. Okay? Any technology comes with associated problems, and if we're going to do it right in getting this technology to be used effectively, we need to be aware of these and av avoid these problems to the extent possible. Okay. So some of the things, muscle decon deconditioning. I don't know of ev any evidence of this, one way or the other, but it's a common question I get. If I give my worker an exoskeleton, will their muscles become weaker? 
and they therefore become more likely to be injured. Okay. I'll do it again. I don't know because I don't think there's any evidence either way out there. My guess is no. Why do I guess that? Well, because exoskeletons are typically being used for fairly demanding physical tasks where the task imposes a risk of injury. When we talk about reducing muscular demands, they're not going down to zero. Okay. So this technology is mainly designed to reduce um, physical demands to the point where injury risks decrease, hopefully. It's not bringing them down to zero. We're not gonna be creating a population of sedentary workers by having them wear the type of technology that's available. Discomfort, I think, is a real problem. Okay. Lab-based studies have, have definitely shown that different devices create more or less contact pressure. They connect to people in different ways. Some have a bunch of straps, others have pads that connect to the body. And people get uncomfortable over time. Okay. Most people get at least somewhat uncomfortable over time. Um, if we want workers to use these for a full shift of eight hours, I think that's something to be definitely aware of. The designers are aware of it. Um, as I see new versions come out and we try them on and play with them, they're really doing a good job at reducing this issue, but it's not zero. If you put on an exoskeleton, could it have effects, adverse effects related to balance? And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that because we just completed a few studies on that specific topic. Could physical demands at other body regions be affected? Okay. If I put on an arm support exoskeleton, could that have implications for my back? Um, there's very little evidence out there. There are two studies that I know of that looked at this quantitatively. One found no effect or a slight decrease on the back. The other study found an increase on the back, both while wearing uh, an upper body exoskeleton. So that, that effect seems to be present, but it's likely very task specific. Are there safety concerns? This is another thing I hear a lot, that we have very confined spaces or we have very delicate parts. If a worker's wearing an exoskeleton and bumps into something, they, they could destroy the finish. You know, so th those are very real issues. I don't know that they've been quantified, but at least qualitative, they are important things that companies and current users and potential adopters are thinking about. So let me talk about that second one a little bit. Could existing technology, which passive exoskeletons, increase fall risks? So again, we did a couple of studies. We were particularly interested in how people recover after being out of balance. Think of this conceptually, someone might slip or they might trip. Those things happen all the time, somewhat inevitable to some extent. What about recovering? In most cases, when we slip and trip, we recover, workers recover. We asked whether an exoskeleton could impair that process. So we did that in two ways. One is a protocol called a tether release, and I'll show what that means in a second. And in the other, we simulated slips and trips on a treadmill. The first study used a back support exoskeleton. The second one used a lower extremity exoskeleton. Okay. So this first study, um, we just got the reviews a few days ago, a few minor revisions, so we're happy that that paper will be published fairly soon. So we had a bunch of young volunteers come into the lab, and we put them in this configuration. So there's a safety harness to keep them from falling to the ground, because that would be bad. Their feet are in a fixed position, and then there's a tether holding them in place behind them. We increase the tether length, they lean more and more forward, and this protocol involves increasing the angle until a person reaches their limit. And traditionally, this protocol involves what's the maximum angle that you can recover from with a single step? And that protocol has been around for over a decade. So we adopted that and looked at what happens when someone wears a back support exoskeleton. Well, why a back support exoskeleton? We chose it because the way the technology works is it generates a moment or torque about the hips. In, in offloading the back, it ends up creating a torque about the hips that kind of forces the upper leg backward. 
When you're recovering from being out of balance, you need to rapidly bring your leg forward. So we speculated, we hypothesized as good scientists, that this back support exoskeleton could impair that recovery. It could restrict the people's ability to bring their leg forward. We collected lots of dependent measures. What did we find? In fact, it did not affect recovery ability. I should mention, we had people do this task with no exoskeleton, our control condition. They put the exoskeleton on, but we kept it off. You can turn off the support mechanism. And then we, we selected low and high levels of the supporting torque. <clears throat> Overall, there was no difference in the maximum lean angle between any of those conditions. So we think two things. One is that protocol might not have been sensitive enough because we only tested a few different angles, like 5, 10, 15, 20 degrees. Okay? But otherwise, we'd pe have people in the lab for two hours, and we couldn't do that. But we did find some very suggestive results that suggested that it was more of a challenge to recover from being out of balance in this forward-leaned position that was more challenging when the exoskeleton was worn and when it was on. Okay? Some of our data is shown here. Um, their reaction time increased. Okay. For us, reaction time was tether release versus the first time we saw the leg move. And there was a delay. Okay. So if it takes you longer to get your leg moving, that's, that's concerning. They also took smaller steps. So they couldn't, because there was a delay in getting their leg moving, and because there was resistance for the, from the device, they couldn't get their, their recovery leg as far forward. And they also were not able to flex their hips as much, all of which is very suggestive. Suggestive of the potential to impair balance recovery. The second study actually provided uh, somewhat more obvious results. So in this case, we were simulating slip and trip-like perturbations. Uh, that's a mouthful. Try saying perturbations 10 times fast, especially when you're a nervous keynote speaker. So I won't do it. Um, we put people on an instrumented treadmill, and we, starting from a relaxed position, we accelerated the treadmill forward or backwards. Okay. If we accelerate it forward very fast, their legs fly out from under them, and they have to recover, which is very similar to what happens when you slip. Okay. Your legs, at least one leg flies out, now your center of mass is back here, and you have to try to recover. If we accelerate the treadmill backward relative to the person, their legs fly out, they're leaning forward, they have to recover. Very similar to what happens when you trip. So I, I, I'm very careful in the wording here. Slip-like, trip-like. So they're not real slips and trips. But we believe it simulates much of what's happening during real life slips and trips. Okay? In this case, we tested a leg support exoskeleton. Okay? These are less common, but, but they're out there. So it's a device that straps onto your legs. And the current technology has two main applications. One is that if you're in a, a semi-squat or even squat posture, it can take some of the loads off your legs, especially your knee. Uh, this technology can also be locked in place, so you can kind of sit in place, taking the loads off your legs. So there are applications where some, a worker might have to bend down and work on something up here. And maintaining that position, even up here, uh, I'm already starting to feel it in my quads. Okay? So the technology uh, uh, can be locked in place so that you can kind of sit in different postures. Um, we tested the technology in three ways. Well, with no legs, leg support exoskeleton, with what's called a low seat configuration, so you can bend down almost into a squat position, and a high seat configuration where you bend down a little bit and then it locks and takes the loads off your legs. We looked at a range of perturbation speeds. So this treadmill, the, the, the acceleration and the peak speed can be adjusted. We looked at slow, medium, and high speeds. We took a lot of different measures. Okay. Let me show you some of the results. Overall, recover, recovery from slip-like perturbations was more compromised when you wear this exoskeleton, and the high seat configuration was worse. Okay. 
I'll give a little more details, but first let's, let's see what the protocol looks like. Okay. So that was an acceleration forward, a relatively slow speed, but simulating what happens during a slip. In this case, the person had no problem recovering. Here's another subject wearing the exoskeleton. Ag again, a slip-like perturbation where the treadmill is going to accelerate forward. This is the low seat configuration. So it doesn't lock in place until you get pretty far down. Let's see what happens. Okay. Recovery. Of course, I saved the best for last. Here's the high seat configuration, where the device locks with just a little bit of motion. Again, a slip-like perturbation. You can probably predict what's going to happen. You know, essentially no ability to recover. Saved by the harness. Okay. That's fun, so we'll watch it again. <laughs> you know, didn't even have the chance to, to shuffle her feet to try to recover. Okay. So all our data together. So what this graph is showing on the x-axis horizontally is increasing perturbation speed. So how quickly did the belt move on the treadmill? On the y-axis, the, the probability that the recovery was failed. I used a specif specific way to quantify a failed recovery, building on earlier evidence. So w they had that support harness to keep the participants from hitting the ground. We had a load cell in there. And if the force exceeded 30% of individual body weight, we call that a failure. Okay. Because uh, in some cases it wasn't clear, so that was our criteria. So you see three curves here. The green one is no exoskeleton. So even when not wearing an exoskeleton, if the speed got high enough, people started to fail. The blue is the low seat, the red is the high seat. And it's pretty clear that in this high seat configuration, for any but the slowest perturbation speed, simulating slips, dramatically increases the likelihood that you'll fail to recover. Trips, not as bad. Okay? There was some increase in the probability of a failed recovery using the exoskeleton, but much more moderate. And really, we only saw interesting things at relatively high perturbation speeds. All right, now we get to the, the wrap-up phase. Um, to summarize a large and increasing body of literature, I think it's pretty clear that the effects of exoskeletons for occupational application, and whether you think about the beneficial or potential problematic effects, that they're really complex, at least involving the specific task demands. Right? Is it static? Is it dynamic? What's the duration? Is it cyclic, non-cyclic? What's the specific postures and forces? Even what's the environment? Things like slip and trip hazards. There are effects of the individual worker. We don't know as much about this, but the evidence is starting to come out. Different ages, genders, individual strength, anthropometry. And then the specific exoskeleton design. Is it passive, active, or both? Um, what is the pr what is the the torque profile? Meaning, how does how are torque generated versus posture? How is it adjustable? What's its weight and weight distribution? So these are all complex, influencing factors, and somewhere in the middle is what you might call the sweet spot. Okay. Some combination of task demands, worker characteristics, and exoskeleton de design will lead to very effective applications. We just don't know where that sweet spot is yet, and it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of people, like those in the audience, compiling and sharing knowledge till we get there. I would also suggest we need to think about what exoskeletons are. Are they PPE? I'll ask you, raise your hand. Do you think exoskeletons are personal protective equipment? Okay. I'm not going to say you're wrong. I don't know. I know. The LEVO recently got certified as PPE in the Netherlands, or in the EU. Right? 
which is surprising to me actually because I think PPE has to have a demonstrated safety contribution. And I don't think we've, we yet know that exoskeletons of any type reduce the risk of injury, although they definitely might. My thinking right now is an exoskeleton is a tool. Like any tool, it will have beneficial and non-beneficial applications. Uh, if you're talking about a screwdriver, the beneficial applications are clear. Right? You're going to screw in a screw. You're not going to use it to, to attach a bolt. Exoskeletons, as this diagram's meant to show, is a little bit more difficult. What's the proper application of this tool? That's my current thinking, anyway. Well, what about the future? I'm in the talk now, just speculations. So I ask the question here, is the future of work augmentation? It certainly seems to be happening. Right? We're seeing um, augmented and virtual reality. Exoskeletons as another example of just either augmenting the person or lots of different ways to provide them information and feedback. We're starting to see the, the increasingly rapid emergence of active exoskeleton technologies. Recall from earlier that these are kind of, in a sense, smart devices. Right? There's lots of computational power in here. There are strong motors connected to sensors to drive what the exoskeletons do. Um, the one on the left, Cray-X, was developed recently out of Germany by a company called German Bionics. They just opened a site in the US, and we're getting one at the end of this month. I'm really excited. Again, I'm not paid <laughs> by these companies. We had a demo about two months ago, and it was pretty interesting. Okay. So this, this particular device senses your body posture. And based on what you're doing, it generates more or less torque at the hips. It's, it senses how fast you're moving. And I found it very interesting. You know, I'm not going to say it's great and it's going to solve problems, but you know, I sound like a researcher. Yeah, I am. Um, it's very interesting and appealing and intriguing, and we hope to do some testing. Um, now there's been several devices developed for the military, such as the Lockheed device, um, designed to support soldiers carrying hefty loads. And for a while there, a company called Sarcos was marketing this whole body powered exoskeleton, which we were fortunate enough to do some testing on. So this is a very heavy, massive, complex device. Uh, current passive exoskeletons you can think of at one end of the spectrum. Although they're very sophisticated devices, they're also conceptually very simple. This is the complete opposite end of the spectrum. Right? 15 active torque generators. You strap this uh, almost 200 kilogram thing on yourself. I was lucky enough to try it on for a couple of hours. It's really cool. You can grab something 100 pounds, lift it up, walk around, and you don't even know you're holding it. Okay? I only fell down twice. <laughs> the harness caught me. We asked some very basic questions. Essentially, what's the potential? Right? This is definitely you know, uh, edge of the envelope type of thing. What's the potential? Could it help for common occupational tasks? And what's it like to learn how to use it? So briefly, we did a few studies. Um, very small studies, they're, they, they were hard to run, only six people, so you know, it's suggestive but not definitive given such a small sample size. We had them do some load carriage tasks, just walk back and forth for objects weighing up to 26 kilograms. And then some simple load transfers, you know, move, an, move an object up and down from different positions, in that case up to 47 kilograms. <laughs> that work was published in case anybody's interested. One of the things we found is that, yeah, the exoskeleton works under some conditions, in this case based on muscle activity. Okay. The y-axis is showing uh, muscle activity for different muscles in the back, which a lot of demands on the back muscle for either carrying loads in front of you or lifting and transferring objects in front of you. Uh, we had lots of other muscles, but th this, these particular results, I think, were the clearest. So you see two lines. Uh, the, the solid line is what happens with, uh, with the exoskeleton. Along the x-axis of each graph is increasing load mass. Um, the other line, the dotted line with the open circles, is without the exoskeleton. 
So what we saw fairly consistently is that for low loads, the exoskeleton was actually worse. But for pretty high loads, it reduced muscle activity. So again, there's this idea of kind of a sweet spot, where there's some combination of task demands and exoskeleton design that could be beneficial. In this case, for load carriage, don't bother using it for all, anything but really heavy loads. The similar thing for load transfers, but for almost all the load transfers, muscle activity was reduced in the low back. Okay, what about learning to use it? Again, we did a fairly small study. We had five experts. So these were people that had used the exoskeleton for 20, 30 hours. Okay. They were pretty smooth. They could use it consistently. And then we brought in some novices. We had them just do simple walking back and forth. Again, we had them do load transfers and we just watched what happened. Okay. So even after three testing sessions, novices had not converged on the experts. Right? For walking, they took shorter steps. Okay. Um, so three testing sessions involving roughly between two and four hours of exoskeleton use, even after that time, they were not behaving like the experts. So that kind of suggests if you're gonna use something this complex, be prepared. It takes an awful long time to learn how to use it effectively. <clears throat> During the load transfers, even again after three sessions, their performance did not look like the experts. So some very important or potentially important outcome measures like task completion time was quite a bit slower. They were converging. So you see, see, you see the three Garay bars, which are the novices over time. And the yellow arrow is meant to show, well, they're converging to the experts who are the black bars, but they're not there yet, even after several hours. So I didn't know Jack was going to show it. You know, the, I think this is becoming the, the required slide in any talk about exoskeletons. <laughs> but I can do Jack one better because <laughs> this is a, a shot from our, our lab testing. You notice. This is science fiction, this is reality, and they're converging. Okay? And there is a real need, I think, for this technology, even though it's right now edge of the envelope. Uh, I know in, there is still manual tire sorting and movement out there in warehouses, and those tires can weigh 40, 50 plus pounds. Um, I did this task, that's not me. Um, I did this task holding up two 40 pound tires and again, you don't feel a thing, so. All right, so to, to wrap it up, I think more information is needed. Yeah, 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 researchers always say that right before they ask for funding, okay? <laughs> but the point I wanna make is that until we have that information, I, I think we should be cautious in our approach and that will be one of my recommendations that we need to know how to optimize the design of exoskeletons. What's the, the best use of active and passive elements? Can we predict in advance risks and benefits? Because testing is hard, even in the lab, definitely in the field. And there are researchers around the world trying to address these questions. I think we need to think about system level fit, that it's not a simple issue of give a worker an exoskeleton and life will be good. I mean, there's practical issues. Where do you store it? How do you deal with hygiene if multiple workers are using an exoskeleton across ship, et cetera, et cetera? What are the training needs? And we need to think about enhancing implementation to make life easier for the people out in the real world. They don't have the time, typically, or the resources to do extensive trial and error. So the more we learn and that we can share with others, I think we can make this process more efficient in the future. So evidence is emerging rapidly. So this is from my database. In my bibliographic software, I have a folder on exoskeletons. These are my rough estimate of the number of papers per year that were relevant to occupational exoskeletons. Okay. And what do we see here? Well, when I first started looking at this in 2019, I thought eventually every paper published in the literature would be about exoskeleton because there was an exponential increase. I'm, 
it's tapering off. And that made me think about something I had seen a while ago, which is sort of a classic thing called the hype cycle. Something comes out, there's rapid excitement, there's a realization that something's not a silver bullet, the small ones, the small companies get eaten by the big companies, there's some disillusionment, eventually there is productive, effective mainstream application. I think we're right at that upper curve, at least from the research perspective. You know, we may be seeing, we're reaching the peak in terms of publications per year, maybe. We're also seeing small exoskeleton companies being bought by bigger ones. I talk to lots of people and I'm hearing our initial enthusiasm and, and excitement is starting to dampen a little bit. We're finding that the number of applications of exoskeletons are less than we originally thought. Okay. So we're maybe on that downhill. But I'm also starting to hear a little bit about we've narrowed down a few cases where we're seeing very positive applications. So I think over the next few years, we're going to maybe have a go down the roller coaster a little bit, but then we're going to come back and find that this technology can have some very useful applications. But I do want to, I do think we need to be careful because you can still go to producer websites and find quotes like this. You know, they can say what they want as far as, as far as I know in terms of legal implications. But most of these, to my knowledge, have, have no formal support. They may be true, they may not. So again, we need to be careful. What's the future? Okay, now if you quote me out of context, I'm going to sound really stupid. This is my prediction for the future of occupational exoskeletons. Active, smart, and soft. What do I mean by that? Well, I think the active technology, where the devices are sensing what the person is doing in different ways, where there are sophisticated control algorithms which can be infinitely varied and can even learn from a person, that's really exciting. If they can get the weight, re the weight down and the battery requirements. And there are really smart control algorithm types out there developing devices like I mentioned the CRAX as one example. They work pretty darn well and this is really the early phases of that te technology. I also think the, f the future is soft and what do I mean by that? Well, we do lots of demos for people in different occupational sectors, construction, mining, etc. And a clear message I hear is that these exosuits that are mainly soft materials are much, people are much more receptive to them. Why? Well, you don't have to strap this complicated thing on. You don't have things sticking out upward, backward to the side. Y if you want, you can cover it up with a pair of coveralls. Nobody even knows you have to wear it. It's much more comfortable over time. Um, these are two of the devices I'm aware of. Hero Wear, I guess, is here. The other is a company out of Europe. I can't remember where. I think this combined with active and smart technologies is going to explode in the next maybe five years. That's my prediction. Don't hold me to it, but that's the best I can guess based on my knowledge. <coughs> okay, my last slide. Points I hope to leave you with, that there are challenges in finding a good match between a worker, a task, and an exoskeleton design. It's not impossible. I think it will get easier over time as more knowledge accumulates. Again, I'm a champion. I believe exoskeletons are going to help a lot of people. But I also think we should treat them not as silver bullets, but as tools that have appropriate applications and potential risks. And we should be aware of and minimize those risks to the, to the extent possible. I suggest exploring, doing so on a small scale. Um, there are, I know, some companies in the past that have kind of jumped in, a dozen, 50 exoskeletons, and I think they've been a little bit disappointed. Okay. That, that suggests to me that starting small might be a good idea for those that haven't started yet. I think the good exo companies are honest. They, they know from experience where their technology has worked better or worse. Okay. And most of the companies I've talked to are, are honest and will give you a, a, a true answer if you ask them. 
I also suggest that benefits may or may not be found for the reasons I've tried to emphasize and may take time to recover or take time to realize. Right? We know musculoskeletal disorders often take a long time to develop and after an intervention can take a long time to resolve or to get quantitative or measurable benefits. The same is likely to occur with exoskeleton. So you may not get a return on investment in a month. It could take a year or more. And just the fact, again, there's a lot of really smart people and clever designers. This technology is changing so fast. The research we did even five years ago isn't really relevant because those devices aren't on the market anymore. The new devices are better. Okay? So it's hard to keep up, but it also makes it exciting as a researcher and I, I think for users out there as well. So thanks to the, some of the folks that have funded our research, uh, I'm obliged to say that you know, what I say here, my, my numerous opinions, they don't necessarily agree with. <laughs> and the last thing I wanna share with you is probably the best vacation I've ever had this past August. Anybody know, recognize this? Banff, yes. What an amazing place. One of the most beautiful places I've been and a rare moment of solidarity between my two teenagers, well, not teenagers <laughs> anymore, my, my two now grown kids. Who, who would have thought they were cats and dogs when they were younger? And my wife said I had to show this last picture. She said, you know, you're a professor and all, but you're still a stupid American tourist <laughs> who showed up at 5.30 at Moraine Lake. It was 35 degrees and you had shorts on. I mean, t to my credit, I thought it'll warm up when the sun comes up, forgetting that it's in a valley surrounded by big mountains. It, you know, that, was, that was me all morning. So that's all I had. Thank you. If you don't ask a question, Jack will, yeah, and it'll be hard. <laughs> I don't want to ask a question, because it's not you, it's not good for me, but there we go. I'll just drop Hi, I'm Dana Greenlee, so really enjoyed your presentation. Thanks very much. So my question for you is, as kind of someone who's practiced in the field for lots of years, I'm kind of used to thinking of the whole engineering controls. So why would I want to use an exoskeleton when I could use a robot, do something that is permanent? Okay. That's a very good question. There's, let me rephrase the question, be, if you don't mind, because I think there's a couple <laughs> components to it. The, the first, why would I use an exoskeleton versus a more permanent solution? Outstanding question. I think in ergonomics, we always try to fix the problem, reduce exposure by changing a task, um, I think m most applications of exoskeletons are where alternatives are not feasible. I'll use Boeing as an example because uh, they're here. Um, I've talked to several folks at Boeing. Getting an intervention in, inside the fuselage of a, an aircraft in, in production is really hard, right? Could you hang a hoist from the ceiling? Well, you're inside a fuselage. There's, you can't hang it from the fuselage. Could you bring in a material handling device? Well. It's kind of a very delicate situation. So they're looking at exoskeletons as a solution where other solutions aren't feasible. And that's just one of many examples. Uh, if you're on a construction site, what are the alternatives? Well, sometimes you could use so an assist, but in other cases, it's just not feasible. You can't get the, the, the relevant solution on site. Um, but I think the start of your question brings up a bigger issue. I, are exoskeletons an engineering control or an administrative control? Right? Most of us learn in class, if we take an ergonomics class, that we should start with engineering controls because they're a more permanent solution, they're more cost effective in the long term versus administrative controls like training, et cetera. 
So I would turn the question to you, if you don't mind. Do you think exoskeletons are an engineering or administrative control? I don't know myself. I've had, I, I, I can go both ways. So I, I'm going to do the disclaimer thing, probably a bit of both, okay? Just it, definitely the technology is more engineering. But, you know, listening to your stories and just, you know, having lived through the whole back belt era, yeah. um, you know, even hearing protection, people don't put it in properly, they don't use it properly, they don't. So to me, that goes down to the whole PPE administrative, a procedure that people don't follow, don't use. I mean, I've been in workplaces that had beautiful lifting devices, you know, vacuum hoist that people chose not to use because it, you know, took one second longer. So I think of this, if it's uncomfortable, people won't want to use it. So like I totally agree 100%, the comfort level has to be there or people won't even look at it. Okay. So. I agree, yes, you raised some very important and critical points. Thank you. Hi there, Amy Dubray with the Workplace Safety and Insurance Board in Ontario here, our Workers' Compensation Board. Uh, so my question is whether or not you've seen exoskeletons used with any injured populations, because this is something we're looking to consider for injured workers, but of course, there isn't a whole lot of research out there. Yeah, so that, that's another good question. It br uh, brings up an issue a lot of people are thinking about. Could exoskeletons help with people that have ongoing injuries or with return to work following an injury? To my knowledge, there have not been any published reports on either one. Any interest in that research? I think there's an awful lot of interest, <laughs> yes. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Th those are harder studies to run um, for ethical and practical reasons. Uh, I will share you just one case example. We interviewed a worker. And for confidentiality, I'm not going to, I don't want to say anything more about that. But this is a worker that for years had worked with shoulder pain. And then as part of our discussion said, with this exoskeleton, I can go home without pain. So that's an N of one, but it certainly suggests the potential for people that have ongoing injuries. Um, I think the return to work right now is kind of speculative, but um, eventually somebody will test it and, and we'll find out. I think it, it has potential for that. Hello, uh, Andrew Reitzel, ergonomist with WorkSafe. Um, oftentimes when you see implementations like this, sometimes the negative aspect of it is there's less interest on the part of the employer than to actually address you know, root problems. So we're gonna use an exoskeleton instead of actually looking at reducing you know, the load or you know, finding, a, like you said, an engineering control to deal with that. Yeah, you're, abs you're absolutely right. Um, <coughs> I think the, the concern is that an exoskeleton could be an excuse, to, to rephrase your point perhaps, that I don't have to s take the time and effort to redesign the job or to create a more permanent solution, back to the earlier question. The exoskeletons aren't cheap right now, but maybe they, they're seen as cheaper and quicker than other approaches. Um, as a researcher, what, what can I do about that? The only thing I can do is when I talk to companies is I try to encourage them, look at more permanent solutions first. Um, but most of the ones I've talked to understand that, that they're looking at exoskeletons where they've already tried other solutions. Uh, they couldn't come up with feasible solutions or, those, or the solutions were just too time or research, resource intensive. Like, to redesign this workstation is going to cost us a half a million dollars. We're never going to get that. But we may be able to get $5,000 to get an exoskeleton for this worker. Uh, is that true across the board for our, all companies? Surely not. So I, I guess it's up to us collectively or as ergonomists to spread the message that the, the, this should not be the first solution of choice. Maybe it's the last solution of choice when all other things have been attempted. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Yep. 
Hi, I'm Olmestic Unifor. So I have three questions. The first one is, are any exoskeleton companies profitable? Thank you for not asking all three questions in a row. My, uh, I was going to, but then I stopped yeah, and yeah, I saw you. Yeah. <laughs> Age and short-term memory and all that. Um, I don't know, to be honest. Fair answer. The second question is, has anyone looked at the social aspects of workers in the field that are wearing the exoskeletons and the interaction between their employee, their co-workers and managers and, you know, because it takes, I know we've had at, uh, in, at Ford, we had a number of trials and there were some challenges socially between workers that were wearing that and if anyone's looked into that, that's the second question. They've looked into it to my knowledge in the sense of People are trying to understand what drives this thing called intention to use. You know, with any technology, you want to understand why, why people would be willing to try it and continue to use it. With exoskeletons, they're trying to figure out, if exoskeleton use is voluntary, why would some workers in some situations use it versus not? And some of the things that have been learned over the years are comfort, perceived performance, um, perceived safety and the social aspects. So that, that's part of the conceptual models that are out there. Um, I'm not aware of any formal reports of how prevalent those types of things or what dimensions of the social aspects are, are particularly um, forceful in determining intention to use. So the, the short answer is yes, but I think there's a lot of details yet to learn. It certainly is one aspect of making a Absolutely. successful use. Yeah. The last question is, are there any documented cases of injuries of anyone working with an exoskeleton? Are there documented cases of injuries using an exoskeleton? Not to my knowledge. Thank you. Okay, Boeing has one. Do you, you want to share any more information? No. <laughs> uh, just simply because I'm not familiar with it, not, not because I, I don't think it's not worth sharing. Um, I, I know somebody, um, I believe they were not wearing it correctly. Mm. And that would be, in, the, in the, the particular brand, you have to have that thing on correct to, to avoid that. So I believe that was the case. But... Um, that's a correctable, fairly correctable situation. And from what I understand, the injury wasn't so extreme as well. So um, that part okay. worked pretty good. Okay, last question. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Mitch Carswell, Sandalwood Engineering and Ergonomics. Uh, just a quick question about comfort primarily. Um, have you really looked into temperature or environmental conditions um, and how that could impact either adoption rate or risk of injury? Yes, we have. And in fact, you'll hear a little bit about that in the talk I'll do with Marty later, yeah. that one of the, the biggest concerns of using an arm exoskeleton in Ford final assembly was the heat load. That in, in the spring and summer, some of these factories can get quite hot and humid. And the workers said, putting the exoskeleton on just makes me even hotter and I sweat more. So ye absolutely, yes. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Some wonderful questions. We're, uh, we'll certainly revisit many of these at the panel talk this afternoon with their experiences of how you introduce these skeletons, get people to buy in to wear them, and strategies of when you implement them as well. In my defense, I think that was a wonderful fundamental talk showing the evidence from your lab <laughs> and why exos are good in certain situations and maybe not in others. And please join me in thanking Maury for that wonderful talk.